Thanks for joining us today. We love to hear how God is using this ministry in your life, so we encourage you to share your story with us at info at fellowshipgj.com. Also, if God is using this ministry to impact you, we want to encourage you to partner with us financially. You can do that online at fellowshipgj.com and pick the giving option that works best for you and help us continue to bring the message of Christ to our community and beyond. Again, thanks for joining us and enjoy today's message. <laughs> you know, I believe that there are things in this life that are going to bring tears to our eyes. There are things you and I are going to go through. The Bible even talks about there's a season to weep and a season to laugh. But I am absolutely 100% convinced that many of us in this room shed tears that are totally unnecessary. The, let me give you a little backstory to what you just saw up here. Because of the brevity of... Uh, uh, are the benefit of brevity. We were not able to show you all of this particular video, but in this video, you see a beautiful little girl. And what is going on with her is that she has a love for green apples. She sees on the counter that there are what she thought was green apples, and she makes numerous requests for her mother to give her one of those apples. Her mom consistently communicates to her that those are onions. They are not apples. The child persists and pesters to an elevated state, believing that her mom is keeping something wonderful from her until the mom allows her to learn something from experience that she was trying to teach her through instruction. Have you ever thought something might be wonderful and awesome and incredible, and then you got closer to it, and you started to experience it, and then you realized that the very thing you thought would make you smile would actually make you cry. Well, I'm thinking that the mother assumed, as you and I did, that once the child took a bite of that onion, that she would realize that this is not an apple. She would admit her error in judgment. She would put down the onion and simply walk away. But as you and I just witnessed, she continued to eat. Eyes watering, nose running, mouth and throat obviously burning. So may I suggest to you that this child started to eat the onion out of curiosity, but she continued to eat the onion out of stubbornness. Because stubbornness, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, will cause you to ingest and digest something that is not good for you for long periods of time simply because we don't want the person who told us it was wrong to be right. Huh. Huh. The Bible has terms for this. The terms in the Bible are called somebody who is hard-hearted or stiff-necked, always referring to somebody who is unteachable. And when a person is unteachable, they stay stuck in a cycle. 
because breaking a cycle always requires course correction. And course correction requires that person to admit, I am going the wrong direction. There are three words that make every relationship beautiful. There are three words that can turn around problems within every marriage, within every relationship, with even our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And those three precious, important words are, I was wrong. And I just felt the air suck right out of this room when I said that. So because we are a spiritual church family, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to repeat those words with me. I want you to say them with me. And if you need to learn to lean over and say it to somebody that you brought with you that you hadn't said it in a long time, you can do that in church because this is a safe place to do it. Everybody together now, here we go. I was wrong. I have known Anna, my best friend, for 44 years. I have been married to this woman for 42 years. I love this woman, but she is married to a guy. I'm just a man, and I close doors like a man, and I shut organized drawers, wham, like a man. And there are many times in our life where I have had to say over the last 42 years, I have had to say I am wrong. I have had to say to her at least a couple thousand times, honey, I was wrong. Now, now here's the thing. I want her to be able to trust me that I'm gonna get the direction that God wants for our family. I want her to know that, honey, I'm gonna pray about that. I'm gonna to try to sense the, 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 the wisdom of the Holy Spirit on that. I don't wanna lead us down the wrong. I want us to be, you know that, hey, if I, I want us to make a good decision together, but lean on me to know that I believe this is right. But there are times in our relationship because I'm just a guy who, who lives with an unsaved mind and an unsaved body, there are gonna be times that I will put us on the wrong path. And if I do that, I don't want to st- stubbornly stay on that wrong path. I want to get it, us off of that as quickly as possible. And the way to get off that path is to admit to this woman who has told me I was wrong on that from the beginning that she was right and I was wrong. Stubbornness. Stubbornness. Because it doesn't mean when you admit that you're wrong that you're the wrong person. It means that you're the right person. You, you, just, you, you just got on the wrong path. Now, let's just say that you have a desire to get to a particular destination this spring or summer. Let's say you desire to go over to Denver, and you want to see a Rockies baseball game. You want to go to the Park Meadows Mall and do some shopping, and you want to eat at a restaurant that you love for lunch or for dinner that we do not have here on the Western Slope. That is commendable. That is wonderful. That is honorable. And there is nothing wrong with that desired destination. However, with all the sincerity of your soul, if you pull out of the Fellowship Church, you go on to the first traffic circle and you take the second exit. First exit, front of Joe, boom. Second exit, I-70 West. No matter how sincere you are, I-70 West will never get you to your desired destination of going to Denver. Now, it is perfectly normal for good people imperfect people to jump on the wrong path from time to time. What is not normal is for you to stay on that wrong path when you know it's the wrong path. So what God does is give you little subtle signs along the way when we jump on the wrong path. Signs like little ones now, little Loma. A little fasted. Mac. <laughs> Mac, that's weird. Bigger signs. 
welcome to Utah. (laughs) And when you finally realize that you are on the wrong path, the only thing you've got to do is turn the car around because you will never, never get to Denver by going west on I-70. Now in this illustration, all it costs you is about $3 a gallon in gas. All it costs you is miles. All it costs you is is, uh, having to turn around maybe an hour and a half when you get to the Moab exit and go, oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna turn around. And it takes you an hour and a half to just get back to where you were when you started. And that's okay, you don't be embarrassed by that, we all have to do it. But in life, it costs you the age that you're in right now. In life, when you do it, it will cost you years. You see, when we allow stubbornness in our life to keep us on a wrong path, to keep us taking bite after bite out of an onion that will never be an apple, then we will cause ourselves to shed tears that were never necessary in the first place. The only thing that will work when you hit this this kind of thing, which you will, is a U-turn. And the Bible calls U-turns repentance. And the definition of repentance in the Bible is a change of mind that produces a change of direction. Stubbornness will keep me giving attention to something that has me crying just so other people will not get the pleasure of knowing that they were right. But at some point, you have got to mature enough to where you come, you come to this conclusion, I don't care who was wrong, I don't care who was right, I just want to be all right from this day forward. You see, these words, I was wrong, can shift an entire relationship. The words, I was wrong, can shift a career path. The words, this isn't working, can save someone years of their life. You do not have to bury the nose of your car into the Pacific Ocean before you're willing to admit, I was wrong. I uh, accepted Christ as my personal savior when I was 12 years of age. I have a home forever in heaven because of my relationship with Jesus who gave me a relationship with the heavenly father. I uh, have a great life, a positive life, a blessed life, an overflow, abundant life, not because I was saved. You can be saved and on your way to heaven and live a completely miserable life. Salvation does not guarantee you a good life. Salvation guarantees you a different destination from hell, which is called heaven. Your life being good or being bad has to do from this point of salvation to what is called transformation, a renewing of your mind. You can be saved and still live the same miserable, hopeless, faithless life as what you lived before you were saved. When you decide that you want to have a wonderful, awesome life, it takes transformation. That's what we're doing today. That's what we do every Sunday for those of us that are saved. Transformation transformed the changing of the way you used to think to the way God wants you to line up your thinking now. So if you would say, okay, I get it. This onion will never bring me happiness. The biting of this onion is never gonna mean that I'm gonna have a great relationship and a wonderful marriage and blessed finances. This onion, bite after bite, will never be an apple. I get it. And I recognize that if I want to have a great life, there are some changes that I have to make in my mind in order for it to happen. I have to turn around the car. So how do I do that? I'm glad that you ask. John chapter 11, take a look at it on the side screen. Let me give you a little backstory. Jesus is in a different area. He is sent a messenger by Mary and Martha. He's told that Lazarus is sick even unto death. He's probably not gonna make it. 
So in verse 5, so although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, everybody read that with me again. Although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, again, Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Now, wait a minute. If you love me and I need you, why wouldn't you come immediately? This is for all of you that think that sometimes Jesus runs late in your life. If you are convinced of verse 5, that he loves you. And by the way, brothers and sisters, you are loved by the heavenly Father on a crazy level. He thinks about you constantly. He wants to make your dreams come true and give you a fun, happy life, joy-filled, overflowing, prosperous But if you don't understand and believe in your soul, verse five, you will never think he's being fair to you in verse six. But if you do, verse six is just part of a lesson. I'm gonna be okay. Take a look at the next verse. The Bible says when Martha, or finally he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judah. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary, well, (laughs) she's obviously ticked. She stayed in the house. Martha said to the To Jesus, Lord, if only you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, she says, even now when hope is gone, when my future's buried, when it's dead and over, when I can't see tomorrow, even now, she said, I know that that, that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, yeah, of course he's going to rise again when everybody else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. He says, take me to him. And Jesus was still angry. Notice this, when he arrived at the tomb. Now, this is important. Why was he angry? Because he had been telling them all along, even back to with the disciples before he came, everything's going to be fine. And you know what everybody else was saying? Everything is not fine, and it's not going to be fine. They were saying the opposite of what Jesus was saying, and Jesus was trying to get into their head, it's all going to be okay. So he gets to the tomb, and he's mad. Notice, if you would, the, the Bible says that the tomb was a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Now, take a look at this picture real quick, because this was a common grave in that day, very similar to the one that Jesus would put in in his tomb, like a hole and a rock, a cave, and a stone fashioned to it where it could be rolled and sealed in front of, a, in front of, that, of that particular hole where that body would be. Now, Jesus says in verse 39, roll the stone away. Now, here's my question for you. Uh, couldn't Jesus have rolled the stone away? <laughs> Couldn't you went, stone rolled away? Is he not God enough to do that? Jesus tells them to roll the stone away. Now the problem that needed to be fixed was behind the stone. Am I right? Jesus could have moved the stone himself, but he was trying to teach him something. And this is it. I will perform the miracle you need, but I won't move the stone. Because I will do what you can't do, but I won't do what you won't do. You move that which is hard, that which is difficult, that which is heavy, that which is stuck. Oh, wait a minute now, here we go. That which is stubborn, out of the way, and I'll give you the miracle you're looking for. You move that which is stubborn, and I'll do the rest. But I will not do what only you can do. I'll partner with you in it. But I won't do it myself. I I believe in miracles. I do. I, I, I always have, though. I believe they're for today. I believe they happen all the time. And I've seen and witnessed them happening in my life own life over and over again. Um, I believe with all of my heart that I could spend a lifetime working and toiling and sweating 
difficult stuff, challenges. I believe I could work my whole life doing everything I can do at the very best that I could do it. And Jesus could accomplish all of it and more in a second. I believe that. I also believe that God loves me. And I believe that he loves you. And I believe that the answer you're needing, you're praying for, and you're just gut-wrenchingly hoping that God will come through, I, I, believe, I believe you can have it in an instant. Because I believe with all of my heart, verse 5 for you, he loves you. You just think he's late, or it may not happen. No, no. He loves you, and he's trying to partner with you and teach you something that you and I need to know so badly. I want you to know that uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are, uh, we tease each other a lot. We treat each other like siblings, and you guys, I pick on you, make fun of you a little bit, stuff like that. You pick back on me. You girls, you ladies, I treat you like sisters. I tease you a little bit, pick on you, you pick on me. It's a brother, sister, brother, brother kind of a thing. And, and if I'm not teasing you or messing with you, it's because I'm not sure that I like you yet. <laughs> but if I really like you, I'm messing with you. Because that's, what, that's just how, but I wanna set all of that aside just for a second. With all of that aside, I wanna tell you this. I am so incredibly proud of you. Because you guys are carving out a Christian life in an anti-Christian culture. And even though you think you're failing from time to time, you're doing great. You're loving him. You're worshiping him. You're serving. You're giving. Here you are on a Sunday morning singing and loving and learning and having your mind transformed again and again. And I love you for that. And I believe for you, I believe for you that God wants to give you that miracle he wants to fix a problem for you that is behind a stubborn area in your life. And the only thing you have to do for your next greatest miracle of your heart is to grunt and move and strain and push and pull and get that stubborn thing out of the way. And you know how it starts? Just turn around. I, I was wrong about that, y'all. It's embarrassing and all. That was the wrong path. More money, job, bigger house, square footage. That's never gonna make me happy. This isn't what I thought it was. It's never gonna be an apple. I'll call it. I don't have to worry about being embarrassed. Everybody else already knows it. But I'll call it, I was wrong. I just, I was wrong about that. I tell my wife, that was dumb. I was wrong. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll remember that next time. I, I should have put that up. Sorry, I didn't mean to make that harder on you. That was stupid. That was stupid. I don't know why I did that. I apologize. I'm sorry. How often do you do that? 15, 20 times a week because I'm not interested in who's wrong or who's right I just want to be alright and I'm not gaining years this next week's going to go by and you're going to come back here Palm Sunday and you will never get next week back again ever and you can spend it miserable and you can spend it unhappy and you can spend it feeding your mind with all kind of negative stuff. 
or you can allow the Holy Spirit of God to finally say to you, this is the area where you have been stubborn. Just turn around. You turn around and I'll turn it all around. But you've got to move that stone. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I pray that you would identify the onions in our lives, (laughs) those things that misrepresent themselves as something that we really want. But in the end, they're not what we wanted at all. Those ways that seemed right, but were never truly right. And they're just burning miles, costing us money and time, and shedding unnecessary tears. You're a wonderful, awesome God. You make my dreams come true. You make all of our dreams come true. So Father, I pray this week, as we're driving our cars, as we're waking up from sleep, as we sit down at the dinner table, as we have conversations with loved ones, a light would go off in our minds that that little stubborn area right there, right there, is standing in front of my next gigantic miracle. And I no longer will ingest or digest something that is not good for me simply because I don't want to admit that the person who told me it was wrong (laughs) was actually right. I pray this over every person in this room. And I pray for miracle miracle breakthroughs this week right before Palm Sunday in every one of these ladies lives and in every one of these men's lives and I ask that none of us would ever shed another unnecessary tear because of stubbornness in Jesus name everybody said Y'all are love. See y'all now. Thanks for listening to this week's message at Fellowship Church. If you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. The Bible says in the book of Romans, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. You can do that right now. I just want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are Lord, that you died on a cross for my sins, and that you rose again. And God, I thank you for that. I ask you now to be my Savior, to guide my life, and to give me a home forever in heaven. And God, I ask you this in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, or if you need prayer, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us at 970-245-PRAY or at prayer at fellowshipgj.com. Thanks again. We hope to see you next week.